Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I will make a start, I think, as people are arriving into this session this afternoon. Um, welcome to this talk that will be delivered shortly by Dima Darman. Um, if you have any questions for her today, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so please go ahead and submit any questions that you have throughout the session in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And without further ado, I will hand over to Dima to start her presentation today about her Epic Kitchens project. Thank you. Right. Um, thanks, Claire. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, let me know if there is any difficulty. And as Claire said, you're very welcome to ask questions in the Q&A during the talk. This talk really is about the combination of computer vision, machine learning, wearable cameras, and uh, the title, which um, I'll be explaining in more details is source balance meets machine learning. Okay, so vision or the visual sensors, i.e. cameras of all sorts and types vary. We might, depending on our generation and age, we might have a different picture if someone says a camera of what that means. I think this is a very generational thing of what would you draw as the standard or prototypical camera. Um, perhaps you would think of, of, of the webcam, whether it's separate or integrated into your computer, or maybe a webcam that's able to track your head as you go and left or right and has more understanding of the scene. Our mobiles now have cameras and they probably form the most used cameras in the world nowadays. Of course, there are cameras that are remote to us, observing every act that we do, particularly in public places. There is increasingly these uh, types of event cameras that capture very high frame rate in sports and the GoPro is a name that many of us would have heard. There are all types of other cool cameras like these um, cameras that capture one image a minute and can really log your day. Um, there are more event cameras that are more attached to the hardware. There is now these Xbox type of cameras that sit in front of your um, TV and are able to observe you and interact with you as you play a game. There are some that none of us might ever own, like this Ozo camera, which is used in filming. It has uh, 16 different cameras around, produced by Nokia. You can kind of throw it in the air and it will capture the full sphere. And increasingly, there are these wearable cameras, which are able to capture the world as you walk around. So what's the title of this talk? We're all familiar with the term surveillance. Probably in the UK in particular, we are familiar of the pros and cons of being watched and the advantages of these cameras, all the way from capturing and uh, images of people as, as they break the law to being able to feel more secure as you walk downtown in the evening. But increasingly, there is a new term that is not new in itself, but is increasingly popular. So while ser in surveillance means from above, sos is the opposite Latin word, which means from below. So this is us being able to, min to monitor maybe ourselves, maybe others, maybe monitor Big Brother that's actually monitoring us. And we're all familiar with a few examples that the fact that we are now having these cameras and we are able to observe or record what we capture has transformed the interaction between the citizen and um, the government or the governing bodies in countries. So surveillance is the ability of people to capture what they do as they do it for many reasons. It could be to basically uh, all these cyclists who want to capture how drivers are behaving, or if you are a driver and not a cyclist, you're the driver who wants to capture what the cyclists are doing. But we're all familiar with these dash cams, for example, capturing what we do from a driver's perspective or a cyclist's perspective. But there are also all these cameras that are capturing, you might hold your mobile and capture as you go around a scene or a city. What can we do with this type of footage? This is the footage that we capture as we go around our daily life. It's recording what we do. And looking around what we currently have in the current present time, You'll see all these people holding their mobile phones as they go around. They're attached to their mobile phones in extremely funny ways. And how many times have we seen ourselves or others having to cross the street while we're still checking something on our phone? 
The picture on the left is from the web. The one on the right is actually, I captured it in China a couple of years ago. This generation uh, is, is really tied to our phone and increasingly we all have this need to remain connected. So people who are working in egocentric or wearable camera understanding believe that the future is moving from these handheld devices, which we currently all rely on um, to remain connected to wearable devices of all types and sorts. Now you have your hands free. You can still remain connected and capture the world, but you don't have that, um, that problem of one or more of your hands is tied to holding that connecting machine. If you're familiar with the term uh, Google Glass, this became popular in the news at some point, and it's the, one of the first commercial wearable setups. It's not the first wearable setup. We've all been playing with different setups before, but perhaps this is the first one that a user can just buy and use and is commercially accessible. There are other types of wearable cameras. As I said, these uh, memory cameras that capture one uh, image a minute have been part of um, uh, digital health and being able to, to kind of capture particularly for the elderly what they do, etc., and remind them of the activities of the day. Sports has picked up the notion of wearable cameras. And, and now you'll see many professional and amateur sports people um, targeting those cameras that maybe you can uh, take them into the water and they can get wet. And these are robust, high frame rate wearable cameras. They tend to be mostly head worn or cap worn and capture what you do. And even with our standard mobile phones, there are, all, there are some attempts by others, amateur attempts to make them wearable, right? So you, you'll see lots of funny um, headwear or, ha or shoulder wear types of setups. So you have your phone, but you're still having your hands free. So people who deal with these wearable cameras believe that this is the future. Once we have one of these setups, people will stop using the handheld devices and will move into the wearable devices. We've been working with egocentric cameras or wearable cameras for a while. So this is a project in 2010, now 11 years ago, time flies, where we were monitoring people doing industrial setups and the ET style setup that you have at the top was what we were playing with. So we actually have a camera that monitoring the space, a head mounted camera, and what you see in front of the person's eyes is some sort of a projection that can give people guidance on how they can perform tasks. So as I said, in, in research, the notion of wearable cameras has been there in a while, for a while. And now uh, you'll start hearing more and more of on some of these cameras as the major players in the field are using them, sometimes for gaming, sometimes for navigation, increasingly for um, industry, military, surgery, etc. At Bristol, we have been focusing on egocentric or wearable camera understanding for a while. And the work that I'll be presenting to you is part of a team. So this is from our typical Christmas gatherings every year. And as you can see in 2020, this was a virtual gathering as we were spread around the world. Hopefully in 2021, the picture would be uh, more intimate like the, the other ones rather than remote. Um, but throughout the, the pandemic, we have been continuing this effort of understanding um, how we can take footage from wearable cameras and make them useful to everyone, which is where surveillance, so you capturing what you do with the world can be learned or utilized with machine learning. In fact, our main focus has been on human object interactions. And we've gathered a large scale data set, which is the title of the talk, the Epic Kitchens Project. And this data set focuses on understanding what people do in their homes, particularly in their kitchens. And I, um, I have hopefully shared my audio and I'll be able to show you the first um, video that we released when this data set now three years ago was made public.
since the datasets release, it has been downloaded more, around 3,000 unique downloads by people from 42 different countries. The main trick that made this dataset really interesting, really challenging, is that it was captured in people's homes as opposed to um, you know, capturing something in an office kitchen or in what people call a smart home, which is not your kitchen, it's very clean, everything is in place, and similar to what if you watch any videos recorded about cooking online, you'll see a pre, everything is pre-cut, everything is clean and ordered and in place. If we are to understand how people perform stuff, say in their kitchens, we need to be able to perceive actions from their cluttered environments and also from their natural setups where they might be doing lots of things at the same time. Following this huge success over the past two years between 2018 and 2020, we went and extended the data set, increasing its the number of people involved and the challenges related to it, resulting in the release of what we call the Epic Kitchens 100. And I hope you're not fed up with our traders because I'm going to show you the second one. I have a feeling this is not going smoothly for some reason. So maybe I'll skip, I'll skip, I'll, I'll skip this video, but you can see the follow-up trailer when this data set has been extended from its original 55 hours to a hundred hours, but very critically to capturing new setups and new people. So Epic Kitchens, this project is aiming to capture what people are doing from their personal perspective. And it started by a data collection exercise, which is giving people cameras to take to their home. They wear head-worn cameras, so they have their hands free. And we asked them to actually go and record everything they're doing in their kitchens for three days. That means they put the camera up, they start recording. And once the recording started, they just step into their kitchen and do whatever they were planning to do, preparing their coffee in the morning to washing the dishes in the evening. This huge data collection required to make it useful for machine learning required not only the footage, what we call the input, but also the labels, which is what do you want the computer to learn about what you're doing? You're currently peeling the potato or washing a dish. To gather these collections, we went through a combination of what we call a narration exercise. So really adding subtitles similar to the subtitles you've seen in movies to say now this person is peeling potato. And from these, we went and actually refined these into what we call start and end time. So from this moment to this moment, this action is taking place. And as you've seen, we first released this first version. And with anything to do with research, the first time you do it, you don't do it perfectly. So we did this extended data collection. We improved the way we label. We improved the density of these labels, so how many actions we're labeling per minute to really capture everything the person is doing, resulting in this Epic Kitchens 100, which is now the largest data set. Well, even the previous version was the largest, but an extended version, making it really a very large data set and the largest data set internationally in egocentric vision or capturing what people do from their personal perspective. So putting the story together, we believe that wearable cameras are the future. There are clear indications that people want to remain connected. The hardware is being set up. What we're missing is the machine learning or the intelligence that will allow us to be of assistance to the user, as well as understand what they do to actually have an intelligent accompanying system. Currently, we call our mobile phones smart. However, at least from a vision perspective, I'm not sure how smart they currently are. So this is really towards visually smart future wearable setups. One of the aspects that we've done in the extended collection of Epic Kitchens is we went back to 16 of the participants who collected data for us in 2018 or for the 2018 edition. Interestingly, eight of these were still in their original homes or flats. So we were able to capture footage 
two years later of the person performing similar tasks. And you know, this is an easy task for a human that you know that this is the same environment and the person is performing the same task. But whether machine learning models are capable of doing this same logic is still to be asked. And we show in, in the paper we published last year that there is a lot of, there is a gap between how the models perform if they were trained on something captured two years ago and then tested on footage two years later. So this is whether the models we're using will survive the test of time. Similarly, eight of them have actually moved home, giving us another challenge of looking at the same person with mostly the same tools. So this is the same knife and spatula and pan, but the person had naturally moved flat. So whether we're able to capture and understand their um, their activities in now a new environment, which I guess is again a very natural thing for a human, but yet computer vision or machine learning is struggling to achieve um, that um, obvious mapping. And perhaps we don't yet have the test bets to assess these models capabilities. And this test bet allows for that. So as we said, we took this footage and the footage then was associated with an explanation. And that explanation is the start and end time of an action, what the action means, and then mapping that action to a verb, what the person had done as an act, and the noun, what type of objects the person had applied that action on, like opening a fridge or pulling a drawer. And this is the, the number of examples that we have in the data set. And the, the y-axis, so the counts, are log scaled. So log scaled means that this line is actually um, 10, this is 100, this is 1,000, this is 10,000 examples. And for each of these, in terms of the act, you have the verb like taking or removing or lifting or choosing. And the same thing for the nouns, that there are a lot more nouns in our kitchens, whether they're appliances, whether they're cutlery, vegetables, etc. So only on the verge of appliances, we have examples of people interacting a lot in the kitchen with the tap, quite understandably. The second most, of, most common interaction is with the fridge, then with the hob, then with the oven, then with the kettle, etc. And this is the natural uh, interactions that all these people have done by giving us their full three days of kitchen activities. So this is the data set in terms of what we call the annotations. And machine learning models would be taking the footage and the annotations and being able to learn as well as evaluate. And currently, for the third year in a row, researchers are trying to test their algorithms or their models on some of the open challenges of computer vision or machine learning. Perhaps the simplest one that I am guess everybody can kind of understand the objective is we call, we call it action recognition. And in this case, out of these long videos, what we're asking the researchers to do, we already give them a start and end time, what we call a clip. And we ask them then to give us the action and the object, right? The verb and the noun forming the action. And we have a server on which people evaluate their models. And as you can see from, I think this is from last year's challenge, you can see that the winner is doing 70% on how many verbs they're getting right, 52% of how many nouns they're getting right, and only around 43% of how many actions are getting right. So that's, that's an understanding of, of how challenging the problem is. And you can see, if you look at one of our uh, challenges, the number of people submitting and getting a ranking of, their, of the performance of their models. And over the every year, we have a, a meeting where we meet and discuss First, we discuss these solutions to understand and share the knowledge and everything is, is open sourced. And equally importantly, we are able to compare these models on the same test bed. And in this case, this is the evaluation set of Epic Kitchens. And if you're interested, you can look at the web page of Epic Kitchens to understand what we do, what we're collecting, and maybe keep track of the challenges and the challenge winners. Before telling you about some of the research we're doing, with Epic Kitchens, maybe it's wise to ask, to pose if there are any questions, and if there's something you want to ask about the data collection and annotations. This currently is the largest 
um, or the most downloaded data set and the largest at data.bris, which is the University of Bristol's research facility for sharing and downloading data. It's the most downloaded data set and has been for the past two and a half years. So a few months after its um, release, it became the most popular and the most downloaded data set from Bristol and it remains the same and really is um, kind of now a, a, a model for other people to collect and release benchmarks for other types of things um, within computer vision and machine learning generally. I'm not seeing any questions on the Q&A. So if this is the case, maybe I'll use the time, maybe as you type any of these questions to tell you about some of the research that we do at Bristol using this interesting resource. In addition to the obvious, which is we are also participating in these challenges, trying to do action recognition, trying to do some other challenges, we call them um, action anticipation. So what's the action that you're doing next? or action detection, so from a full video, really finding a particular action. So while we also are producing some novel research in these um, for these tasks, we're also trying to ask or propose approaches that do a bit more than just saying, what is the person doing? We have interesting and a novel line of research on understanding how well is someone doing in a particular task. And we call this skill determination. Similarly, we have research on when we believe the person completed the task and are going to move to the next step. We also have lots of research on combining vision and language because we have these narrations. What does open mean? Uh, so you might be referring to something as putting something down or placing it down or leaving it behind and how these different meanings can be associated with vision. And as you've seen, the data is recorded with audio and we're doing a lot of research on audio visual. And I sampled a few that I thought might be of general interest to tell you about. And I'll tell you about this work, which in its title, it might look very complex, multimodal unsupervised domain adaptation, but the practical application is quite obvious, I hope. And in this case, we are taking a clip from the data set. And typically what we do in computer vision is we take the images themselves as well as, as the motion. So this here is something we call optical flow. So it's a model of the motion between subsequent images. And if you put this into a model and you're able to predict what the person is doing, and you train that model in one kitchen with lots of labels, then you try to uh, use it to detect another person in a different kitchen. And as I told you, the data set gives these challenges because some people might have moved kitchens or maybe we learn from one participant and we try to recognize what the other participant is doing, current methods in computer vision struggle. And what's shown here at the top is what we call a feature space. And the main message here is that the two colors, which is kitchen one and kitchen two, have nothing in common. They really live in different parts of the space. And in this research, we were trying to make these two align so that maybe if we learn how someone is stirring um, these uh, vegetables in the pan in one kitchen, we can recognize it in another kitchen. And in this work, we've introduced another additional um, constraints while the model learns. And while we do these constraints, as you can see with these blue and red colors, you see that they are kind of changing shape. And by the end of the process, they are fully aligned. And this is the proposal we made in this work, which was published in, in the major computer vision conference called CVPR. So what you see in these blue and red examples, these are two people cutting some sort of a fruit. Um, I'm not sure if the other one is a fruit, but yeah, it's they're cutting. And what you see, the difference between these three models is the first model has these two different dots very far from one another. So you can't really learn from one and apply it to the other. And then as we move through the learning process, we reach a point where they are very close and we're able to learn from someone cutting and then recognize the other person um, cutting in that environment without the need for additional labels. Another really cool idea that we've been working on is related to maybe how well you're doing it, but also related to language is to look at adverbs. So you're familiar that adverbs are added to lots of maybe instructional videos, especially in cooking, telling you that you should turn something slowly or you should fill something partially or make sure you dice your uh, onions 
finally, and one of the questions we asked is, can we really focus on these adverbs? Can I look at the video and figure out whether the dicing has been done finely or coarsely? And in this setup, and I'm going to skip some of the, the model details to show you some of the results, we're, doing, we're using something called an embedding space that allows us to look at the verb and then the application of these adverbs, like quickly, to the verb. So we look at rolling quickly in particular. And you'll see some of the results of this model, which again was presented in a conference, and both the code and the, um, the, uh, the models that are being used here have been published for the research community to, to try. Um, you'll see now someone doing a particular task, like mixing quickly, and the prediction will appear at the top, which is the person is really saying, yeah, this is indeed someone doing something quickly. So quick is not given to the model, and it's being predicted from the particular action. I'll show you another, oops, I to show you more of the video. Um, maybe an example of someone mixing something slowly. And again, this is the video being provided as an input. And at the end, the model is able to, to observe that input and then understand the person is indeed doing slowly given a limited number of adverbs. So kind of this is like eight adverbs that it's trying to predict, like coarsely, slowly, quickly, etc. You can imagine that the type of information needed to perform this task is really complex because it needs to not only understand what the objects are, but understand the motion and be able to understand what slowly is regardless of whether it is, um, you know, the person um, rolling something in a pan or mixing eggs in a, in a bowl. The last thing is really related to audio and how audio plays an important part in us understanding actions. And increasingly, how audio play an important part in these machine learning models, also understanding what we perform if we were able to capture not only images of us interacting with the world, but images along with audio. And almost everything that we have now, whether it is in these GoPro wearable cameras or our mobile phones, capture both the video and the audio. And we as humans understand what we perform by including the senses of vision and hearing. So in this work, which is yet to be presented this summer in one of the major um, audio relevant conferences called ICASP, we're able to understand that actually interactions take two different um, types. These are what we call harmonic sounds and percussive sounds. In harmonic sounds, the frequency of what the action is gives you an understanding of what it is. And let's get an example. So it's really, we distinguish the sound of, of water and we can really distinguish that sound throughout and it's the frequency of that sound that gives us understanding that this is indeed water. But there are other interactions, these are all from Epic Kitchens, where it's a different type of sound that we're after. It's momentary and it is really um, a percussive act, the sound. In this work, we showed that this approach or the need to identify harmonic and percussive sounds exists not only in our data set, Epic Kitchens, but in other data sets that might not be egocentric, like, for example, another very famous data set called VGG Sound, where there are harmonic sounds. as well as percussive sounds. And starting from this understanding, as well as from the understanding that the human auditory system has these two pathways to understand frequency and temporal events, we proposed a machine learning model that can take as input the audio, but deals with it differently. And we call this the audio, the slow auditory pathway and the fast auditory pathway. And these really attend to the harmonic and the percussive sounds by, if you're more familiar with machine learning, by having the first one having a low temporal precision, but a large amount of channels to focus on the frequency, while this other um, pathway has less channels, but a high temporal resolution, 
and we're able to combine the evidence from the two because as we get an event in, we don't know whether it's a harmonic or percussive. We want to be able to recognize all types of sounds, understanding that they could be either. And we also have these convolutions, which really are trying to understand what's within that sounds. And in this case, we're proposing to use something called separable convolutions that attend separately to the frequency and to the time. So um, before I conclude, I told you about Epic Kitchens and it is the largest data set and it's really kitchen based and is really setting the standard. Um, inspired by the success of Epic Kitchens, we now have a consortium of 11 universities, which by the end of this year, will release an even larger and more diverse data set called Ego4D. It has some similar and some different purposes. Uh, we're the main UK partner in this 11 university consortium covering universities um, in Africa, in Tokyo, in, in Saudi Arabia, in Italy, and in the US, and um, also in Latin America. So it's a very, very large consortium. And over the pandemic, we've been posting cameras to participants in the UK to capture some of the activities that we think are really interesting and haven't been captured before, whether in Epic Kitchens or otherwise. And I'll give you a visual taster of the data we managed to capture. Similar to what we've done with Epic Kitchens, this will allow us to understand more um, how people interact with the world, maybe interact with their pets, interact with their environment indoors and outdoors, do sports, do gardening, etc. And this will really, again, uh, trigger our ability to understand beyond um, what we have been before capable of understanding or learning or recognizing. I'm happy to take any, any questions uh, by the end. If you're interested, you want to know more about the data sets, or you would like to pick some of the code of any of the papers I mentioned or talk about, or the code related to how you can use the data set, as well as the publications. You can look at my webpage or my Twitter account, uh, contact me or any members of the team. Um, I can't see any questions. Okay. Can you hear me now? It says my internet is unstable. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you, yes. Dima. Um, and um, I think there's probably no questions because that was a really brilliant, clear and, and, and great introduction to your research. So thank you for delivering that for us today. Um, thank you to people for attending as well. As Dima said, if you do have any questions um, following this session today, please do get in touch with her or um, we will also be in touch um, after the showcase this week and we will give contact details if you want to get in touch with us directly if there are any other questions or again if this has captured anyone's interest in terms of um, collaborations or just connections in general please don't hesitate to get in touch so thanks again Dima for your talk and um, we'll say goodbye now and have a great afternoon.